everyone to the next episode in our Hello series. Today, we are introducing you to our very own Janine Bryant. Janine is the owner and CEO of Changing Spaces SRS, a move management company in Lincoln, Nebraska. Janine has been a NASA member for 15 years. In 2019, Janine created a sister brand to Changing Spaces SRS called Easy Right Sizing. At her website, easyrightsizing.com, she provides blog articles, video tutorials, podcast links, and downloadable resources to assist everyone with the right sizing process. Janine's first book, Ready to Right Size, is a step-by-step -step guide to your right sizing journey. It's for older adults and their loved ones, and it was published in 2019. It is the essential guidebook to anyone undergoing a transition and moving to a smaller space. In 2021, she published her second book, Keep the Memories, Not the Stuff, to serve as a guide for anyone who has trouble letting go of keepsakes. This practical how-to book will help you gain a new perspective on life, memories, and our stuff. In 2022, Janine launched her first online downsizing course, it features a downloadable workbook and over three hours of video content as she coaches you through downsizing and moving. Here are the books. Let's get started. Hello, Janine. Hi, Mary Kay. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course. Janine, in both of your books, and they're both excellent, I might say, you often use the term right sizing instead of downsizing. Tell us why and what the distinction is in your view. Yeah, we always say that we use the term right sizing just because it sounds a little bit more positive than downsizing. Um, and we define that right sizing as finding that perfect place between too much and too little, right? And so I always, when I give presentations, which I do a lot, I always say to folks, you know, my job is not to make you get rid of all of your stuff. My job is to help you identify your favorite stuff so that you keep that and then we let go of everything that doesn't matter so much. So it's like, keep the best, let go of the rest. We want, we don't want you to have too much stuff, but we don't want you to have too little stuff either. We want you to find that perfect place in between. And that's the job of the move manager. Yep. When do you think we should begin the process of right-sizing our lives? It's not just for those of us in later life, is it? That's right. Today. Yes. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we okay. all know this. Um, I mean, the there's a constant inflow of stuff into our homes right and if the outflow doesn't keep up with the inflow then the equilibrium gets off balance and suddenly you know you've been in your home for 30 years and and it's you know quite cluttered and so to me and it's easy for me and i think probably a lot of nasa members it's easy for us to preach that because it comes naturally to me and i bet it comes naturally to a lot of us in this group um, to go through your things and to let go of things. And I always joke with my team members, you know, nothing makes you want to get rid of your stuff more than spending all day going through someone else's stuff. You know, you get home and you're like, ah, let's get rid of this. You, <laughs> you see, it's so easy to see the air, you know, the log in the other person's eye instead of the speck in your own eye. And so it's easy to see the air of someone else's ways. And you think, why are they keeping all this stuff? And so then you go home and you you can apply that to yourself. Okay, I don't need, I also don't need seven party planners if I'm not going to be entertaining frequently. So yeah, it's, that's something I love about this message is that even though we specialize and I know all of our hearts are in serving seniors, this is a message that applies to anyone at any age, really. I mean, I have two kids. I have a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old. They need to go through their rooms frequently. Otherwise, you can't walk in it. I mean, the, the inflow never stops. Absolutely. Um, here's a little story that happened to me yesterday, and it, it really is so prophetic because I knew this interview was happening today. But So I was married in 1978, and I... Um, stored my never used, never used wedding china. Lennox Montclair, by the way, was quite the thing back in the late seventies in white quilted bags for the last 45 years. My husband and I decided to donate all of it to a local church in our town that's known far and wide for their fabulous uh, semi-annual rubbish sales. And uh, they've been doing it for 50 years and it's a lot of high-end things. So. Mm -hmm. I felt, you know, maybe that would be a good place. 
We dropped it all off last weekend. We were so delighted with ourselves. Uh, and we were very happy to be free of the space that it took up in our attic. But guess what I did? The sale was Tuesday and Wednesday. And I went there. It ended at nine o'clock last night. I drove over there at 10 to nine to check on. It was all still there. Oh, no. <laughs> Eight place settings for $80. And I was shocked at how sad I was. I know. Um, I was really shocked by it. And um, I was shocked that I was sad and I was surprised that it didn't sell. Right. Help me, help right. others like me. Why is letting go the most challenging part of right sizing? What tips do you have for those of us who are struggling with letting go? I know it's, it, I, I'm so glad that you shared that experience because we all have had that. I think about, I had a garage sale a couple of years ago. I'm, I'm in charge of organizing our neighborhood garage sales. And so I, I participated. I had a coffee pot out there that we do not use. It sits down in our basement. I'm like, we're getting rid of this. I had $12 on it. Someone insultingly offered me like $4 for it. And I was, you know, I said no. And then later I thought, Janine, what are you doing? That is so ridiculous, you know, but we, it's so good for us to experience that feeling because it helps us identify and have grace for our clients who have those feelings as well. Because the things that we have, you know, my watch is much more valuable to me than someone else's watch. You know, this is a nice watch. And I, you, you feel um, insulted and hurt when your items don't sell at a garage sale or like my company, we run estate sales. It's, it feels like a personal affront to you, right? That someone else didn't want to buy your object that you thought was so lovely. Um, it feels like a, like a dig, I guess. And so I just think it's important and interesting to recognize how much we identify with our possessions and, and we do it as well, as well as our clients, they identify with those things and they feel like they are a part of us. They, we, and we give them more meaning, right? You just said, Mary Kay, you said you were storing that China up in your attic, mm -hmm. right? So it's For not even like it was in that your, once. Yeah, right. It's not like it was in your China hut. You were looking at it every day. And so we're the ones who do that. I mean, my my coffee pot that I was trying to sell is down in our basement. We didn't use that either. And somehow I was identifying with it. And then I was insulted that someone would only give me $4 for it. It's ridiculous. And so we are emotional beings, all of us. Um, it's part of the human condition. But sometimes we have to uh, allow our, our brains to override our hearts and our emotions, right? We have to make sort of the logical decisions, not the emotional ones. And the logical decision is that these plates were not being used and they didn't sell. And so then I don't know if they end up going to a charity or... I don't know. And I don't know if I want to know. No, right? and that's okay. <laughs> yep. And that is okay. You do not yeah. need to know all those things. Um but they're not being used in your home. And even if you had taken them back home, it doesn't mean that they would have been used, right? Well, that's what my husband, when I came home and I was so dejected when I walked in the door and he's like, well, what's the verdict? And I'm like, not good. And he said, well, but we gave them because we didn't use them. He said, you can hardly blame, you know, anyone else. Uh, they're more entitled to reject them than we are. So yeah, it's just, you know, I don't know. It's it was it was surprising to me after being in this field all uh -huh. these years. Uh -huh. It was a very personal experience. We are not immune to that. No, no. Nope. Nope. You talk it, in your book about keeping something well if you're going to keep it at all. Can you explain no. what that means? Yeah, I mean, if something is really important to you, then my challenge and encouragement would be that you keep it well. You don't, and keeping it well is not putting it up in your attic. It is not putting it down in your basement or in a storage unit across town. If this really means something to you, then let's have it out and accessible in your home so that you can use it. Or if it's not something you're using, even like your wedding china, if you just like looking at it because it looks pretty and it sits up there in your china hutch, great. To me, that's using it. Uh, more so than having it stored away in a basement. And so my encouragement to folks is, you know, if you have things that are meaningful to you, keep only what you can use or display because it's hard to love it if it's in a box. <laughs> For yeah. sure. So Janine, the greatest generation has almost entirely died by this point in time. 
That's those individuals born between 1901 and 1927. Then we have the silent generation, 1928 to 1945. It's a smaller demographic cohort than either the greatest generation or baby boomers, and many of them have passed away or, or have already moved into independent or assisted living. Mm -hmm. So we know who's up next. Behold the baby boomer. Those of us, I put myself in there, born between 1946 and 1964, and let the record show that does not include you, by the way. <laughs> what differences are you observing between serving your baby boomer clients and those that you've served in previous generations? Yeah, it's interesting. My dad is, he always says he's the oldest of the baby boomers. He was born in 1946. And um, I think that when we are working with people in that age range, and because we always joke, people ask us at Changing Spaces SRS, like, well, I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm a senior, but can you help me? You know, and I always joke, there's no minimum age requirement to be our client. Um, but when we work with folks in that generation and of that age, I really, I mean, they're really more part, it's more of a partnership um, than the, the silent generation, the older folks who, you know, in, in some cases are less physically capable and they really, they are hiring us because they're not physically able to accomplish this work. The boom, the baby boomers in a lot of cases, maybe they could, if they really needed to, they could get this done themselves, but they don't want to. They're used to hiring out. They're they're willing to pay for someone to come and help them out. Um, that silent generation, they were hiring us because they really had no other choice. And so that was more of a, I kind of see it as almost a caretaker role. And I think a lot of us in the senior move management industry are drawn to the industry because of that. We were helpers. We are caretakers. I think that there's, I think we have to be careful about that in a lot of situations. Um, but the silent generation, that's what we're doing. We're, we're maybe doing it for them with the baby boomers. We're going to be doing it with them because they want to be more involved in those decisions. I also think that a lot of these baby boomers, including my dad, again, who's in, who's the oldest one of that generation, they have been through this with their parents and their parents had too much stuff too. And, but there was not services around like ours to help them through that. And so I watched my parents, um, all four of my grandparents died within two years when I was a kid between, when I was between 10 and 12, all four of my grandparents passed away. And so I watched my parents deal with that. And, and I grew up on a farm and my grandparents lived on farms. And so there wasn't just one house to clean out. There was the shed and the, you know, the shop and the, you know, outbuildings going through that. They had, they, that fell to them to do. And so they know, I don't want to do that to my kids. And so I'm willing to hire a partner, a senior move management company to do this um, with me, not for me, so that it's not a burden to my kids. Absolutely. Let's circle back to just something you just said about move managers and having to be cautious about caretaking. Yeah. I picked up on that. Um, I know we at our conferences, we often have a session on compassion fatigue. Um, what were you talking about when you said that? Yeah, I think that it's it's so important, I mean, in all areas of life to have boundaries. But I think in, in these uh, roles of service providers, where we really, the reason we are doing this is because we have heart, a heart for working with seniors. We love that. And that is what appeals to us about this work. But I think it's dangerous. Um, it, it is very easy for us, I think, to fall into that white knight syndrome. Like we're going to come in, we're going to get you organized. We're going to fix all of your problems. And oh, that would feel so good if we could do that. And sometimes we can do that a little bit. But, you know, you can't, I say this to my team a lot. I say if their old house was a mess, their new house is probably, their new apartment is probably not going to be perfectly organized, right? I mean, they have lived in a mess. They're the ones who created that mess over the last 40 years in their home. They're not going to transform and become a completely different person once we move them into the new place. And that was a realization I came to 
when I was younger and thinking about what is it that I want to do in my life, I thought originally, oh, I'd want to be a professional organizer. I thought that would be fun. But then I realized that professional organizers typically work with chronically unorganized people. And oh, that sounds, I want to work with organized people, right? And so we we want to, we, it's hard for a tiger to change its stripes, right? No matter how much we want them to change, that's not really what we're here to do. Um, we're here to, I always say we're here to smooth out that transition, help these folks who are going through a time of transition and help make it as easy as possible. But we, it's da- I think it's dangerous when we fall into the idea that we're going to fix this, all of this client's problems because we want to, we really care and we love our clients and we want to be able to fix all of their problems, but we can't. And that comes after, you know, this is our 15th year in business and you know, after five years, you get so exhausted trying to fix all of these people, you realize, okay, like, here's what we can do. And here's what we can't do. And I think it's important to reflect on that in your own business. Absolutely. Janine, who generally contacts you first about um, hiring a move manager? Let's just say for an 84 year old widow who lives alone. Is it usually Mm -hmm. Mrs. Smith? Is it one of her adult children? Is it her pastor? Is it her estate planning attorney? Or is it all of the above? <laughs> yeah, I would say most of the time for us, we hear from the, the, the client themselves, the senior themselves. Um, sometimes, maybe 25% of the time, it's their adult child. And maybe 10 or 15% of the time, it's um, like an estate, uh, an estate officer, a trust officer. Um, but a lot of the moves that we do anyway, are moves out of a home into independent living. And so it's the client themselves who's still making those decisions. You know, once it comes time for moving to in assisted living, then lots of times the kids are involved. But at least in our city, we find that we don't get hired very much to move into assisted living because those apartments are smaller, they feel more manageable, and those clients are less willing to pay a pretty penny um, to get moved. But I think when those folks who are moving out of a home into a a large independent living uh, apartment, they're still in that mode of like, they're willing to spend money. They want their new home to be beautiful. They, you know, that's kind of our target market. So are you working with realtors a lot? And then also are these independent living communities uh, that they're moving to, are they working with you? Do you have sort Mm -hmm. of a good working relationship Mm -hmm. with several of those? so that it's actually a totally third party person. Yeah, they um, usually, the retirement communities are wonderful enough to be giving out our names to the clients, but still it's typically the client themselves who's contacting us. Um, And then realtors, yes, because we do estate sales and online auctions, helping to clean out the home before it gets on the market. Sometimes realtors are the ones to contact us as often as we can, we try to bring it back directly to the client. Um, I have just found that that is often a better result rather than working with the realtor um, because I want to, because I just need everyone to remember that the client is our client. The realtor is not our client. The client's the client, you know? Um, And oftentimes we're booked up pretty far in advance and realtors, if a realtor is already in the situation, they want to get this house on the market and we might not be able to do a sale for two months. And so that doesn't always go over real well. So. I love that you hearken back to one of the primary tenets of NASA membership that was outlined in, uh, in 2003 by our founding board members, that the client is the person who's moving, not necessarily the person who's paying. Right. And so we never lose sight of that uh, within NASA. And I appreciate you mentioning that. Yeah. If someone chooses to downsize and move themselves in later life, what is the single most important piece of advice you would give them? Um, To let it go now. Uh, The more, you know, I love this quote. It's for professional organizer, Sue DeRoos. I say it all the time in my presentations. Uh, We all get organized eventually. We just might not be around for it. And so it's that idea that everyone's stuff eventually gets organized. It's either you do it or you're, um, the people you leave behind are doing it for you. And I, I see so often um, 
people just kicking the can down the road, right? If you don't deal with your stuff now, eventually someone will have to deal with it. And when we have clients who rather than sort, they just say, oh, pack it up. We'll just bring it all. And I've got a couple team members who are really good at delivering um, hard advice in a nice way. And so one of the one of my team members, she always says, now, Larry, who's going to get rid of this stuff when you're gone? You know, that's like a nice way of saying like, hey, emptying out your house before you move is a lot easier than emptying out a retirement, an apartment in a retirement community apartment, you know, because we can't, you can't do an estate sale out of an apartment at a senior living community, but we can do a sale out of your house. And so to let go now, um, rather than later, that would be my biggest uh, piece of advice is to let it go now. And, and I think that when we go through this process of right sizing, of identifying really what you're doing is you're setting priorities and you're saying these items aren't the priority for me in my life and in my home, and these items are not, I think we can all benefit um, of going through that process at any age and with not only with our stuff, but with relationships in our life, with the way we spend our time. It's all about setting priorities and being intentional about about those priorities, right? And keeping only the best and letting go of all of that excess stuff. Yes, uh, circling back to your quote, um, it's interesting. Do you work with uh, families after loss? Do, are you referred by funeral directors, for example? Yeah, um, we hear from folks. Let's see. So we do um, over 60 sales a year. And I should know this, it's probably 30 or 40% of them are sales where someone has passed away. And so um, that in those situations, families call us when they say, okay, I need to empty this house out. And we remind them, okay, well, what you're really saying is we're going to sell this home and in order to sell this home, we need it empty. And so then that's when they contact us. Yep. Okay. What do you say to someone who says they don't have enough stuff or valuable enough stuff? to hire a senior move manager? Mm. Well, we always say we want to do a free in-home consultation because, you know, it's hard. We So in our business, we um, specialize in larger estate sales. And we always say we look for $10,000 or more in total sales. Really, it should be $15,000 or more. But um and, and people say, well, I don't know if I have enough to do an estate sale. Well, that's why we do free in-home consultations. So we come in and, you know, some people think their stuff is really much more valuable than it is. And then other people might, I think particularly men in my experience, they might, or adult sons this week, we're working on an estate sale where the parents have both passed away. And this is an adult son. He's a bachelor. And he's like, I don't want any of this stuff, you know, and to him, it's all junk. And we walked through and we were like, no, absolutely not. This is, you got, you got enough for a great sale here. And so that's why we do the in-home consultations. You never really know um, how much your stuff is worth if you're talking about an estate sale. But if you're even just talking about a move, it is worth their time and our time to go in there, visit with them. And then I always say, we'll get you a quote for the project. Or if we feel like it's not a project we can take on, then we've got referrals. And I'm sure that all the other senior move managers on the call, you guys are the same way. You want to be seen as the resource, right? The go-to gal. And um, for instance, we don't really do just sorting sessions in our business. Um, I've found that it's just not a profitable way for me to spend my team's time. So we'll do sorting sessions if they're moving with us. But if someone has no intention of moving and they just need to declutter, then I've got another great gal in Lincoln who's a professional organizer, and we just give them their name. But it is an educated referral based on what we have seen in their home. And so, and then what my goal is always when we leave that potential client's home, even if we've said, okay, we're not the right fit for you, but call this person, this person, and this person, they think, boy, that changing spaces lady was so nice. And then she's still going to talk about us in a positive light to all of her friends. And it's still good marketing for us, even if we're not helping them. Yeah, makes sense. You're very busy as a senior move manager. You have written books. You have developed an online course to help others downsize. You speak frequently. Um, your business is a constant and, and welcome presence on social media. You seem to do it all and pretty well, I might add. How do you define success in senior move management? 
No, that's a good question. I don't do it all. I want to like slash that myth. Like it is not, um, how, what did, how do I define success in senior move management? Well, okay. So for at changing spaces, I always say that my definition, what I want out of this business is that this business is a blessing to me and my family, which means it's profitable. It's a blessing to our team, which means they earn a good living working here and they enjoy the work that they do. It's a blessing to our clients, which means we do a good job for our clients and provide a valuable service. And because of the estate sale side of it, it's a blessing to our community because um, when people shop our sales, we're engaging then with the, the entire public um, of our city. And we feel like we've really created, they've created their own little community of treasure hunters. And so for me and my business, those are the, the four metrics, you know, a blessing to me, my staff, my clients, and my customers, the community as a whole. Um, but that can only, we can only continue to be a blessing if we're profitable, if the work we're doing is sustainable, if I'm not burning the candle at both ends and totally, you know, um, getting burnt out. So you, you have to, you have to do it. You have to hold both of those things in your hand at once. I think it's so interesting. This is kind of going off on a tangent, if that's okay, Mary Kay. One of the things I love about our work is that we have that face time with seniors um, every single week. And they are, are a reflection. I mean, it's like we get to see into the future. You know, we get to peek into the future and we get to see our clients who are in their seventh, eighth, or ninth decade, lots of times of life. That is the accumu their, their life is the accumulation um, of all of the decisions that they've made in their life, right? And so we get to see, and, and because of the work that we do with them is pretty intimate, we know what kind of a relationship they have with their spouse. We know what kind of relationship they have with their kids, their grandkids. We can see physically, you know, what their physical um, uh, state is, the state of their home. We might have some kind of a glimpse into the state of their finances. So we get to see the, the compounded um, result of all of their life's decisions. And that is such a gift because it helps me keep stay focused on what is important in life, right? I, I can't go through my work without imagining what I will be like someday if I'm lucky enough to make it to 85 years old. And when I'm 85, I want to have said, I had a successful business and I have a husband who loves me. I have kids who want to come and visit me. I know who my grandkids are. I can still like move around um, I'm physically strong enough to do that. I'm not surrounded by a bunch of junk. I live in a comfortable home. And so to me, it's it's holding both of those things at the same time, a, a balanced life, right? Good relationships, good um, you know, self-care and a successful business. Because if only we have a successful business, who cares, right? At the end of life, who cares? We have all moved very financially successful, miserable people in our businesses and you know, it's, I just think it's such a gift to pick out your clients and you think, boy, I want to model that one, or I love what that person has done. And they're our greatest teacher, really. For sure. I really appreciate that answer. If you could time travel back to the start of your business 15 years ago, what surprises you most about what it's like today? I would never have guessed that, um, and this is like a personal, this is, I would never have guessed that we would be as successful as we are. Um, and that like is all about like me and the work that I needed to do. I always joke, I'm an English major. You know, I have a master's degree in English and Great Plains studies. And so that is a direct career path to nowhere, as my father lovingly pointed out to me when I was getting that master's degree. But um I, I did not set out necessarily to like own a business. I didn't start this business. My former business partner, um, Linda Cotter, started it with her sister in 2008. I came aboard in 2010 as part owner. And the reason I did that is because I loved organizing and I loved working with seniors. And I thought, oh, this could provide me with some flexibility. I had just gotten married, but I had, did not yet have kids. And I thought, oh, you know, when I have kids, I'm not really sure... Do I want to work full-time? Do I want to work part-time? And I thought this would give me some flexibility. And so 
this was going to be something I enjoyed that kept me busy and that hopefully made somewhat of a meaningful contribution financially to our household. I never would have guessed that we could um, be successful enough where I can support my family. So my husband is 14 years older than I am, but he retired five years ago. He retired early at the age of 50. And the reason he could do that is because the business was making enough money that it allowed us to do that. And so it surprised me that um, we could be as successful as we are. And I think that my relationship with other NASA members and seeing, uh, you know, you, that phrase, you can't be what you can't see. And as I met other people who were out there doing it, I thought, yeah, I can do this, you know, and, and it helped grow our business. So. That's yeah. great. Um, I, you know, we came along, Jennifer and I came along and uh, 2006, and you know it astounds us every day how this field has just grown. Uh, it's expanded in so many new service directions, new populations, mm -hmm. general. You know, it's just it was really the right thing at the right time. Just yeah. as baby boomers were aging, it really fills an incredible niche in in service delivery you know, for that age group. It's, it's wonderful. Where do you think senior move management is headed in the future? Oh, I don't know. I'm excited to see though. I think it's so interesting. Um, just the last couple of years at the NASM convention, and that, that is again, and they're another, they're not paying me to say this folks, but another shout out to NASM, like going to those conventions and just forming those relationships, it helps you get like a 10,000 foot view of the, the industry because our work is so highly, it's such a high touch service that we provide. It would be so easy for us to just be down in the weeds constantly, right? And never peek our head up. And NASM, I think, helps me do that. It's so interesting to see, um, I mean, at the last, so I was 28 when I came into um, Changing Spaces. And I always felt like I was the young one at all these conventions and like, at the, and I'm 41 now. And so at the last convention, there were like quite a few young people and there's more and more men at those conventions, and which is interesting. And more people, you know, these new businesses that are starting, I, I, I'm excited for them. It's interesting because we were talking before the recording started that, you know, a lot of this stuff and folks even who came before me, certainly, it was like inventing the wheel. They had to invent the wheel. And now that wheel has already been invented. So maybe the, the newer members, the newer businesses, they don't have to invent that wheel like maybe we did or certainly people who came before me did but they are going to put their own spin on it. They're going to perfect it. And maybe that ramp up time will be less than for some of us, you know, veterans where at least for in my business, it felt like it took a while to ramp up. Um, there's more industry knowledge that, uh, that we exist out there, right? There's more um, knowledge about the senior move management industry, thanks to your guys's work. So that makes it easier, but it, it's so it's such a fragmented industry now. And, you know, we've seen some efforts to kind of um, conglomerate that a little bit. And I which makes sense. Right. These private these these men in these private equity firms, they're very interested in us. I don't know if you guys have realized that, but they are. They're very interested. And I'm not sure I don't have the answer and maybe they'll figure it out. Um, how you can really. Um, conglomerate businesses and services like this in a profitable model because it's so high touch and high relationship. That's the secret sauce. Um, you know, I always joke with my clients, you know, you can hire two men in a truck to come over and put stuff into boxes for you, but that is not what we do, right? So we are a whole different animal and you're going to pay different than you would pay for two men in a truck to come over and put stuff into boxes. And we have had, and we've been hired sometimes for jobs where we are just putting stuff into boxes. That's really what the client needs for us. And we do it and we're happy to do it, but it's the, those jobs aren't nearly as fun or fulfilling as those jobs where you're really with the client forming a relationship. So I don't know how, um, those services can be, um, 
conglomerated in an effective way, but I'm interested to see if someone figures out how to do it because I, I struggle with it. Anytime I think, I mean, oh boy, Omaha is just ripe for the taking and it's 45 miles down the interstate from me. And even just that, um, I, I am not quite ambitious enough to make that happen because I think of all the, every project has 10,000 little details to it, right? And how do you, it's it's a hard business to scale. And I've scaled it some, and certainly there are others in the industry who have scaled it more than I have, but the scaling issue is a challenge. And I'm excited to see what solutions uh, we all come up with. That's a good point. Um, it is evolving. Senior move management is definitely evolving, which is always a good sign. Um, it's growing and evolving and we'll see what, you know, the future holds in, in terms of your conglomeratization, as you say. Um, but you're right. It is a very highly uh, relationship business. So I think there will always be that person to person component, even if someone is, you know, working for a much larger company. Mm -hmm. Talking about scale, one of my other questions for you was, when did you know that it was time to kick into gear and to scale up. You know, there's such, that's probably one of the most frequent questions that we get from people who've been in business, in senior move management for four or five years. They come to the conference, they see these larger businesses with people with a staff of 20 or 30. And it's always like, how did you know? And what did you do? And were you scared to death? Uh -huh. Because we all know about that restaurant down the street in everybody's town who bought out the restaurant, who bought out the space next door, expanded, right? And they closed a year later because they really weren't ready yet. Mm. They didn't, they, you know, they quit making the money they predicted wrong. Yeah. And how do you, how do you do that? Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm going to say right now, I don't feel like I'm a business coach, but I'll tell you what I did. Yeah, I waited until the last possible minute and I was so exhausted that I could not possibly go on anymore until I got someone to sit in this office and answer the phone, right? I mean, we we used to be the ones in the homes packing the boxes and answering the phone and uploading the pictures to Facebook and doing all of this other stuff. And I used to own the business with two other gals. So there were three of us who owned the business. Um, and in 2014 is when they retired and moved out of state. And so at that time, then I, I really was the only administrative person. And I knew there was no way that I could go out and visit with clients and be in the office to answer the phone and respond to emails and train my staff. And so that was when I hired my first uh, office manager and I... So that was 2014, $10 an hour. And it was like 20 hours a week within a month or two. I said, okay, how do you feel about 40 hours a week? I mean, I could tell that, okay, I have enough work for you to do the whole week, the a full-time job. And it's gone up from there. Um, I'm now on my third. Now, now the gal that's in that position is amazing. And her, she's an operations manager and she has taken more off my plate than I ever thought possible. And so, yes, I was scared and it's a chicken and egg problem because you want to hire because that person, so I'd, you know, we hired, um, team members who were going to work in the field before that other people to help us come and pack the boxes. But of course, if the phone didn't ring, I didn't have to pay those people. Right. But hiring an office manager was different because I had to pay her. She was now a cost center. She wasn't revenue generating. And so I had to pay that person no matter what, even if the phone stopped ringing. And so that's when my overhead started to grow. And, you know, that was just a little bit. And then as we got bigger and bigger, and what really put us over the edge is when we had to start paying for like workman's comp insurance, we got so big and, ugh. and, and then we moved to a new office and, and I'm pretty conservative as far as my spending, um, on the business. That's a nice way of saying I'm pretty cheap when it comes to that, but, um, it's, it's chicken and egg, right? Like we can't take on more clients until we have the capacity to serve them, but we, how are we going to know if we're spending all that money on the overhead, if the clients are going to come and so build it and they will come. I mean, 
I just do, I wait as long as I can. And then I do it when I kind of don't have another choice. And, and when, you know, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about something being sustainable and enjoyable. If you love this work so much and you want to continue offering these services for the next 15 years, you cannot be burnt out working 60 hours a week for the next 20 years, right? I mean, you can be, but maybe that's not going to get you where you want to be when you're uh, 20 years down the road. So you have to um, you have to hire help, and and I would I had enough reserves that I knew because you want to be cognizant of the person you're hiring. If the phone does stop ringing, that person deserves a little bit of runway so that they can at least. If you're not going to be able to pay them, you have to pay them long enough so that they can find another job, right? And so. Um, we, my, our company has always grown at the speed of cash. So we've never taken out any kind of a loan. And because of that, I've always just been very conservative with my spending and grown only when I needed to. Again, I'm not saying that's the way to do it. That's just the way that I've done it so that I can sleep at night. I'm fairly risk averse, which is not always a great quality in a business owner, but it's not all bad either. Well, it seems to have worked. For sure. In senior move management, more than a lot of professions, teamwork makes the dream work. What do you look for when you're hiring someone for your team? Um, I look at every applicant and ask myself, do I want them out in our community representing me? Because I am very closely aligned with I'm not from Lincoln, Nebraska. I grew up in North Dakota. And so, you know, I always kind of joke, like, I don't know anyone in town, you know, and I love hiring people who have been lifelong Lincolnites because then they know when these people call, they're like, oh, well, they used to have the clothing store downtown and they kind of know all of the generational history. And I don't, I'm oblivious to all of that. So the way people have come to know me in my city is through my business, changing spaces. And then here's my, my the picture of my face. I am very picky about who do I want out there in the community in that blue polo shirt, that's our uniform, representing me. And so I, I am pretty picky. Um, we all, you know, that there's that phrase, hire slow, fire fast. And we go through um, two rounds of interviews and then a two week shadowing period just to make sure that they feel like they're a good fit. We feel like we're a good fit. But I, um, of course, look for integrity. I emphasize the fact that we see our, we are interacting with our clients during a very vulnerable time in their life. And I, whoever I hire, I need to trust them with my checkbook, with my child, with my, because that is, they're going to be around my client's checkbook and my client's possessions. Um, I also look for, I think that emotion, that EQ, is that what it's called? That emotional um, intelligence is really important because our clients, I mean, our clients are all over the map and our team is all over the map. When you hire someone, I mean, hiring someone when you have a small team is complicated because it changes the dynamics so much. But even when, you know, our team is medium sized, I would say 20 people, there's, there's people on our team that are all over the map, right? And some anyone I bring on has to be able to interact with and work successfully with all different kinds of people and to do it compassionately um, and to have patience. So those are the things, you know, I can teach them how to pack a box, right? That's the easiest part of it. The, the, the it's, it's half science. That's like the packing the box and here's the way we do things. And here's what the is in the training manual, but then the rest of it is art. Because I can't always train people how to interact in every situation. They have to be able to go with their gut and make a good decision and represent me and all the rest of the people, because they're not just representing me. They're, rep you know, I always say they don't, the public doesn't know the difference between our blue shirts, right? It could be, you could be the person hired last week or the person who's been here for 12 years. If, if the person who was hired last week screws up, you make all of us look bad. So. All right, we won't tell anyone. Um, we'll keep it just between us. But well, what would you say is your biggest marketing secret? What's your secret weapon in marketing your senior move management business? I think it's important to lean into your own natural strengths. And so um, one of my strengths that I enjoy doing and I'm good at is public speaking. And so I will speak anywhere, anytime. I'll speak for 10 minutes or an hour. Whatever you want me to do, I'll come and speak to your group. 
because I think that is so much more, more significant and impactful than seeing an article, you know, a print ad in a magazine and gosh, those print ads are so expensive, right? I've wasted so much money on those over the years and I still do some of them, but boy, they're not going to, they could flip right past that. But if I'm in front of their face talking for 10, 20, 60 minutes, they're going to start to form a relationship with me. And then maybe when they see me on social media, they're going to be like, oh, there's that changing spaces girl. So that's what I lean into. Now I'm very deficient in other areas um, like relationship building. That sounds terrible, but I'm an introvert. And the last thing I want to do is go and rub elbows with someone. I can do it. It just takes a lot of energy out of me and I don't really like it. And so that's not something I'm particularly great at. I'd rather be speaking to a room than like mingling in the room. Um, and so I, tr it, it also helps me to hire for my weaknesses. So to hire people who are able to do those things that I'm not able to do. For a long time, I kind of beat myself up and I tried to make myself do things that I wasn't naturally good at. And then I just kind of maybe I just got too tired and I stopped doing it, but I had to realize there's no one way to be a good business owner, right? There's just like, there's no one way to be a good mom. You, you are who you are. And then you use your strengths to the, to get you the best result you possibly can. Great answer. And I think we're going to end my questions there because we've got some questions in the queue from our audience. So I'm going to invite Jennifer Pickett back to help us with that. Okay, so we have four um, in the queue right now. Um, so the first question comes from Karen um, Ad Adelman. How do you get the phone to ring? What's the best way to get your name out there? Uh oh. Okay, I can. Okay, sorry, I minimized you for a minute. Um, uh, Don't minimize us. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I found you again. Um, consistency. I felt like. I felt for the first three to five years, we were still educating everyone on our business and what it is that we did. I remember we used to always ask folks, have you heard of changing spaces? And their answer was always no. And then I would tell them about what we do. And then they would always say, oh my gosh, what a great service. Now I don't ask that question anymore. Um, people, I know people have, I say, oh, I'm Janine Bryan. I own changing spaces. Oh, and they're, they, they know exactly who we are. So I think it's just consistency. It's, you know, and using whatever um, methods are available to you. So if it's relationship building and knocking on doors, if it's giving presentations, if it's social media, if it's, you know, um, newsletters, I do, I also kind of like to write. So I do four newsletters a year and I keep those, I, I, I have like, I don't know, 2000 people maybe who get my newsletters and you just have to keep pounding them. And I have found, I still visit the homes of clients who have clipped out, you know, a little article that was in the paper or who went to a, you know, they have a business card that still has my old business partner's names on it from years ago. You know, they have it and then they save it. And then, cause they know someday I'm going to need you. So um, all right. From uh, Deborah Sokovin, what do you say to clients who feel that all of their belongings are of value and don't want to settle for donating items or selling them on Facebook Marketplace for a smaller value than they think things are worth? I find that that argument is most prevalent at the beginning of our relationship with them when I go for that in-home consultation. That client is in a different headspace, right? They have not yet moved. It's still kind of just sinking into them that they really are going to move and that this is the start of a new chapter. And so their expectations might be up here. And I and I am truthful, but gentle. And I, you know, glaze. Oh, I don't get really too down in the weeds with how much do you think I can sell this mirror for? I try not to talk about that up here because I, I say, you know, we've got a whole journey that we're going to go on with you. And so the, if you really love this item, then let's keep it. Let's find a way to put it in your new apartment. Oh, well, there's not room for it. Okay. Well then you've made the decision not to keep it. And then are there any family members who want the, this item? Okay. Well, you don't want it. The family doesn't want it. Now we're going to get as much as we can for it. And by this time, maybe they've moved and they, after they're moved, and they're physically apart from their old stuff. I think that that 
that stuff has a little bit less of a pull on them, right? A gravitational pull. They're happy in their new home. They have all their best stuff with them. Now the realtor is involved and they're talking about the realtor and they're talking about when the house will be sold. And now it dawns on them, oh, this house has to be empty in order for me to get the $500,000 out of the home that I'm trying to sell. Okay, now it's not so much how much can I possibly get, but please sell this stuff. Please get it out of my house. And so, you know, we, we always remind our folks, the main asset here is your house. The most important part of our job is getting you moved because on the 10,000 foot view of your life, this is a major transition, right? You are moving into, you're starting, closing one chapter, starting another. Let's not focus too much on how much we're getting for this mirror, right? Because this is about more than that. So let's get you moved. And if you really decide you don't want to keep these items, then we will sell as, sell it as best we can. And then I talk about, you know, supply and demand and, you know, how, how the market works. And then, I mean, generally people are, are pretty happy at that point, you know, after we've sold all of their things. Okay. In that same vein from Karen Superville, do you think it's best not to price an item for sale and just ask what you would give me for it? Uh, or do you think that price on the items closes the door for negotiations? Um, I'm not totally sure I understand, but when, so when we sell items for folks, we either sell them on an online auction, which is, I think my favorite, because we don't have to price the stuff on the online auction. The market really sets the price when you're auctioning it off. Everything starts at a dollar on our online auctions and we do offer shipping. So if you want to shop, you can do that. But, um, then the market, you know, well, okay. Only three people were interested in your item. And the most, one of those three people was willing to pay was $32. And I guess that's what it sold for. At an estate sale, it's like a tag sale where things are priced. Um, and so we do, you know, we price it and then we discount it 25% and then we discount it 50%. So I think that because we're lucky in that we do estate sales, I think it makes our team better at the sorting process with our clients because we know and we see there's no delusions about how much something might be worth worth because if we're going to sell it you know we know pretty much what we can get for it and if you if the client has some other imaginary way to sell it then god bless you let's you go ahead and you can sell it yourself but it doesn't take too long for them to come to the realization and for it to dawn on them oh wait a minute i don't have another way to sell this i'm going to be li living over at eastmont i'm i'm going to be living my life okay go ahead sell it and by that time we've created a good enough relationship with them that they know that we're not trying to screw them. We're trying to get them to their goal. And their goal is to be moved and for this house to be empty so that it can be sold. Um, and that's, uh, which, per what percentage of your um, auction or, or estate sales are in person versus online? Uh, now, since post COVID, we just developed online auctions during COVID. Um, and since then, we do one, we do an online auction every single week, sometimes two, but mostly just one. And then our in-person estate sales have dropped down. We'd maybe do 30 estate sales a year. We used to do like 55 a year. Now we do maybe 30 a year because we're doing um, a, an auction a week. Okay. So um, from Allie Marshall, thank you for sharing with us. I'm in the process of launching my business. It's obvious that my community needs an estate sale company. And I hope to step into that need. I'm pondering how to manage the handling of the sale of items. Yeah, it's That's a lot. Probably I mean, a whole nother, it's a whole nother session. <laughs> it is. Yep. And it's a whole other business. We found that when we first started it, it was good though, because it we didn't have enough moves. We still don't have enough moves to keep 20 people busy. We have enough moves to keep maybe four, five staff busy all the time. So when we were just starting, the estate sales were a nice way of keep giving our team members hours because back then we struggled with keeping our team members busy enough. Now we struggle with keeping them too busy. So it helped, um, it helped me retain more staff because uh, I think at least in my experience, in my city, there's more demand for the estate sales than there is for the move. Because of course, at the end of the estate sale, you give them a check. They're not giving you a check. And so, hey, that sounds good. A lot of people are interested in having an estate sale because they think they're going to, it's their opportunity to make money, but it's a whole other 
you can, whoever asked that question, you can reach out to me, but it's a whole other beast, certainly, but it's been good for us. Uh, what company do you use for your online auctions? We, my husband, God bless him. He's a computer programmer. And so it's self-hosted on our website. We don't have to, um, I remember when everything shut down, I had 11 estate sales scheduled in the next eight weeks. And that's of course, how long we thought COVID was going to last, right? I thought, okay, we got to figure something out for eight weeks. I had 11 estate sales scheduled. And I said to my, just came home to my husband. I said, we got to figure something out. These 11 people, we have a contract with them. They trust us to empty out their home. We got to figure something out. And so he got to work. He researched, there are some of, you know, Auction Ninja is maybe one of the better ones that we would recommend, but he researched all of those and you pay a percentage to them. And with the volume that we were expecting to do, he thought, no, I'm going to, I'm going to create something. And so he did that for our platform. Now, do you have an auctioneer's license? Nope. Um, and I don't need one. You don't need one in Nebraska to do online auctions. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Um, it's a couple of, of, of staffing questions. Um, do you typically pay your employment candidates during a, the two week shadowing period? I do. Okay. Do you have any advice for finding employees during this time? The best employees I know have come from my existing um, team members and people that I know, um, ref personal referrals. I, um, and then, if, you know, I have certainly gotten some great off the street applicants, but my existing team members and my existing network, they're my best judge of character, especially the team members, because the team members are thinking, who do I want to work with? I want to work with someone who's going to pull their own weight, who's going to represent us well, who's going to, you know, they don't want to work with some slacker. So um, let's see. Oh, and I, another thing, I follow a lot of other senior move managers on Facebook. And when they advertise that they're hiring, I screenshot that stuff all the time because I love the way they describe, you know, with their job descriptions are perfect. And I copy those all the time. So now you guys don't have full service movers. You contract with movers, correct? Yep, correct. How about the people who do the packing? Are they the same people who help in your estate sales? Um, yes, we kind of have little siloed teams, but also when the stuff hits the fan, we all have to help out. So yes, and I, my team does like that because when they get kind of worn out on moves, then they like going over to the estate sales. But with the estate sales, you don't have as much client interaction. And so maybe that's not quite as rewarding. And so they like that flexibility. Uh, you mentioned you don't find it profitable to sort for someone who is not moving. What, which services do you find to be the most profitable? Yeah, just those, it's just the small project, right? Because we don't charge by the hour, we uh, do package pricing. And so um, we will sort for someone as long as they're moving. And so typically, you know, the, our, our most profitable moves are probably folks moving from a home into like a two bedroom apartment or a two bedroom plus a den, which is effectively three bedroom apartment. And they've got a whole bunch of stuff at home. And so they need to, they need to have three or four sorting sessions. And then we're going to have three days of packing. And then we have a move day and then we have an unpack. And then we do a post move tweak. That's something I learned from my senior move manager friends and a service they offered. So we'll come back a week later and we'll kind of adjust in their new apartment, some of the organization, or we'll take some stuff back to the house if they brought too much. So those are the most profitable ones. And it's because we charge, we do package pricing, not by the hour. Okay. Um, we are really running short on time. So I'm going to end with um, one question, one last question from Cameron Early, who is one of our members in Australia. Um, ah, yes, yeah, scaling the business. We thought we had the formula right as a hub and spoke business model before COVID. But now we're effectively starting over again. Post-COVID, I'm finding that what worked previously isn't working like it used to. I can't seem to find slash motivate the right people what to do. Mm. Mm. So she's having a hard time with staffing post-COVID, yeah, I yes. think it sounds like. Yeah, it is like you're starting from scratch. Um, because we developed our online auctions during COVID, we... Like I was not at home baking bread during COVID. We were just as busy during COVID, uh, maybe more busy. Um, and so I didn't experience that. But I don't know. I again, I I don't know. I go back to so many of the ways that my fellow senior move managers have advertised for positions. You know, they say, I think it's carrying transitions up in Minneapolis. They say, like looking for a part-time job with a purpose. And you know, those are the the employees that I hire 
by and large are not doing it. They're doing it because the extra money is nice to have. It's not because they need the money to pay their bills because I can't guarantee hours. Right. And so I always say, you know, you, this is, this is best for someone who's looking for a little extra side income, not for someone who's relying on a consistent paycheck, because for instance, the week of Thanksgiving, we're not doing a whole lot, which means you're not getting paid. So, um, I really hone in on finding staff members who are looking for that part-time job with a purpose. But I know I, it's, it's really, and I know we're short on time, but it's so hard as a business owner to keep yourself motivated to keep going. And I'm not here to say like, I have it done perfectly. I, the, the hardest part of owning a business is not necessarily leading your team. It's leading yourself and motivating yourself. And so it's rough, but you know, keep going, keep going. Well, we are closing in. Um, we're a little past the hour. We cannot thank you enough, Janine, for being so candid with us. Uh, we are so happy to have you in our NASM family, and uh, we uh, hope to see you in Kansas City in the fall yes. at NASM 2023. So yes. take care, and thank you again for all the sharing you did today. I know everyone on the call really appreciated it, and we do too.